Good morning, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Brother Kelvin. Good morning, sir. Come on in, brothers and sisters. It's Thursday. It's time to wake up with the word. Come on in. Come on in. Would you share us this morning? Would you share us with your family and friends? Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Denise. Good morning, Margaret. Good morning, good morning, Periscope. Good morning, Facebook Live. Hey, Brother Toby. Bless you, sir. Good morning. Good morning, conference call. Good morning, Sean. Good morning, LLS. Good morning, Ella. Hey, H. How are you, dear? the boss, all my elders coming on this morning. God bless you, Brother Bill. Good morning, Regina. Good morning, Phyllis. Good morning, Jackie. Good morning, good morning. Turn with me in your Bibles, brothers and sisters, to Luke chapter number 7, verse number 20. Good morning, First Lady. Good morning, Kaya. Good morning. Good morning. Thankful Thursday. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, Kim. Bless you. Bless you. Good morning. Yes. Thank you, Crystal. Luke chapter number 7, verse number 20 through 23. Luke chapter number 7, verse 20 through 23. Okay. Good morning, Tasha. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, Tasha. Good morning. Turn with me, brothers and sisters, to Luke chapter number 7, verse number 20 through 23. Luke chapter number 7, uh, verses 20 through 23 is our, as we're focusing on, hey, Elder Jay, uh, we're focusing on uh, prayer this week. Um, and here is a here is a, a prayer that was sent up to Jesus. Luke chapter number seven, verse number twenty. When the men came to Jesus, here is a story of John the Baptist um, sending his disciples to Jesus. And the Bible says, when the when the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you, asking, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? At the very time Jesus cured, cured many who had diseases, sickness, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied, this is Jesus, replied to John's messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and what you have heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Verse number 23, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Great verse of scripture. Put that on your refrigerator. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Brothers and sisters, most of us call God, at least in theory, ruler of the universe and creator of all things. We proclaim him on Sunday mornings as Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. All things were made by him and, and he alone upholds all things by his word. This, this, this notion speaks of a universal God. But here's how I have some, sometimes viewed God and, and I wonder if you do too. But how often do we reduce our supposed 
universal perspective on God down to our private small world. How often does your faith and mine hinge not on whether God is a healer, but whether or not he chooses to heal me? If he answers my prayers, then he's God. And if he doesn't, then there is no God. Often, my friends, we have this misnomer, we have this, this very microscopic, uh, myopic view that equates God's absence, that there is no God, to his silence, to our prayers. I call this praying while pouting, that, that in, in, in the real world, in, in, the, in the futuristic universal theory, we believe that God controls everything, but we sometimes doubt his very existence when we don't get what we want. If you occasionally suffer with this type of seasonal faith, don't worry, you are not alone. Greater than you and I have had to deal with this problem. And today we want to dive in and then grow out of our immature way of approaching prayers and our faith toward God. You see, John the Baptist was uh, one of the greatest men in the Bible. In fact, Jesus said that he was the greatest of all time. It was John who leaped in his mother's womb when Jesus' birth was shared to his mother Elizabeth and was the forerunner to Jesus, telling everybody about his coming. He baptized Jesus, my, my friends, and saw the Holy Spirit descend on Jesus. He, and yet, when his own life started to turn in a matter that he probably didn't expect and definitely didn't want it, he prayed and then pouted. He prayed and then he, he pouted. He prayed and then he began to pout. He prayed that his cousin, you know that his cousin, the savior of the world, would definitely come and get him out of the prison that he now was in um, for doing God's work. He wasn't, he wasn't in prison for doing wrong. He was in prison for preaching the gospel. And, and then, therefore, he had seen Jesus give sight to blind. He had seen Jesus heal. He had seen Jesus raise the dead. And he just knew that if I pray to Jesus because I'm a good Christian, because I do the will of the Father, that yes, Jesus is definitely coming to hear my prayer. Here's, here's the amazing twist that happened in this story. But Jesus, my friends, did not come. He did not come to John. Not, not only did he, did, not, did he not come to John, he didn't even send Peter or James or John to encourage John while he was in prison. He didn't send um, his disciples to say, I'm on my way. He didn't send his word, you know, when he sent his word and he healed, when he didn't even have to come, he just had to speak the word. He didn't even do that. Nothing. He left John, the greatest man in that Jesus said the greatest man who had ever been born, the, the one who had served him faithfully, the one who had did everything that God had called him to do. He left John in jail. So what do you and I do when we have done everything we have been asked by God to do? And then we've prayed for others and they get healed. Pray for other people's marriages and they get better. Pray for other people's finances and they get restored. And when you pray for yourself, nothing. You see, John started out expecting, then, it, then that expectation turned to hoping, and then that hoping kind of turned to wishing, and then that, that wishing turned to doubting. Because after a while, we kind of say, God, why, why, why? You answered everybody else's prayers. Why aren't you answering mine? And so, I mean, opening... Doubting everything he had seen in life. John started doubting. His, his prayers were not being answered. So he started to doubt the veracity of Jesus' call on the earth. Isn't that funny? How he, he knew who Jesus was. And yet because Jesus did not answer his prayer. He started doubting the very existence. The very veracity of who Jesus was. Has your faith, my friends, ever turned in God sharply because of a circumstances that affected you so severely that it made you question the very existence of God? Mm. Has our faith in God 
become so private that despite what we see God do in other people's lives, we will walk away from God because he doesn't answer the prayers that we want. Has, our, has your prayers ever turned into a pouting session with God and start having conditions about what you will do from God for God because he will not answer the prayers that you want him to answer? So John, so John, this mighty man, this uh, Baptist, this man who baptized Jesus, who said, he that, he that cometh after me, I'm not worthy to, to uh, uh, um, fix his shoelaces. That same John who said the same thing about Jesus sent his disciples to Jesus to ask this very weird question. Are you the one or should we look for another? Isn't it funny how sometimes our own conditions will cause us to doubt in who we know God to be? What a crazy pouting prayer from the very messenger who was the very one who told everyone that Jesus was the one. We then asked the question, are you the one or should we look for another? When Jesus, when John was the very one who told everybody that Jesus was the one, because when it's, when it comes down to Jesus not doing what we want him to do, then perhaps he's not Jesus at all. In fact, just before John gave the assignment to his disciples, his disciples had just told John that Jesus had just raised a man from the dead. He had just, that John had just heard a testimony of Jesus raising a man from the dead. And in the next breath, John says, go ask him, is he the one or should we look for another? Because oftentimes, our, our vision of who God is gets blurred by our own experience. None of that mattered to John. I don't care what he's doing in other people's lives. Go ask him, is he the one? Because my personal prayer is not being answered. Wow. How could, how could John's faith has fall, had fallen so far that he started to have second thoughts about who Jesus was? How could we? How could we Know that God is a provider, that God is a healer, that God is a fixer, that God is a, a way maker. And yet when it's time for us to just simply wait on God and for us to trust in his will, we go find something else to call God. We go and establish our own ways. We start doing things our own way because we, we waited enough on God to give me a husband. Now I'm going to find one myself. We waited on God enough to restore my situation, but because he didn't come when I wanted him to come or he didn't come how I wanted him to come, I'm just going to go and do it my own way. And we asked God, uh, have we started looking for another God? Our faith in God is so often tied to not what we see or hear of he, he doing, him doing in other people's lives, but what he's doing in ours, how, what he's doing with the thing I want changing that he keeps alluding. Here's how Jesus answered John and how he oftentimes should be answering us. He says, go tell John what you've seen and what you've heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised and the good news is being proclaimed to the poor. What he was saying to John and what he's saying to us, he said, never base my existence on your personal experience. Never reduce my, my power on your personal experience. Never, never doubt who I am because I'm not choosing to do what you want me to do when you want me to do it. He says, I'm God when you got money and when you don't. I'm the same God when you, when you get a raise and I'm the same God when you get fired. I'm the same God that gives you uh, gives you in the same God that sometimes takes away. Yes, I do heal, but sometimes people do die from their diseases. And when they do, I am no less God. You see, when we don't see God's provision in a certain area, we still need to trust in his and have confidence in his preeminence over everything. You know what I mean? That, that when we don't see God providing what we want him to provide, 
answering the prayers that we want him to answer. We then have to trust in the preeminence or the superiority of God's knowledge or God's will over our lives. You and I are called to pray, but never allow our prayers and the or the outcome to uh, of what we want to be the hinges of our faith. For God, my friends, knows what we need when we need it and how we fit in his will. Here is Jesus' statement to John and to us today. This is this is the this is the cliffhanger. Blessed is he who is not offended by me. That's what he left with John and that's what I'll leave with you. He says, tell John, blessed is anyone who's not offended by me. Every time I read this, this shakes me, brothers and sisters. He's, Jesus is saying that our long-term happiness, our long-term peace, our long-term joy, blessed, hinges not on whether he does everything we want, but hinges on how content we are with being him being the master over our lives, however he chooses to conduct it. Wow. You won't hear that much on a revival from preachers. We, we oftentimes preach that God does everything we want, but that's not true. The truth of the matter is when he doesn't do it, we have to trust and have our faith become solid, not in just God providing for us what we want, but not being disjointed into believing that we cannot be, we cannot have peace, we cannot have joy without getting everything we want. No, Jesus says, blessed is the man who is not offended, who doesn't get off course, who doesn't change his faith because of my will in his life. Whoa, that's maturity, my friends. That's, that's saying I won't leave God despite him not doing what I want him to do. But I won't get bit out of shape. It, what he says, I, don't, I won't be offended. I won't start pouting. I won't start changing my praise based upon the outcome of a prayer. John got the word. You know that? John got that word back. And guess what? Jesus never came to that prison. Soon John was beheaded but he was no longer offended. He was never turned off. He never soured and he was not unfaithful. Even though Jesus didn't do what he wanted him to do, his pouting turned to praise. And in fact, he was in the will of God. He was beheaded and he was in the will of God. He was beheaded and he was still trusting in the Lord. Today, my friends, I invite you to pray with me that I nor you ever get offended by whatever God's will is for our lives. Whether it has us becoming rich and famous or sick and needy, married or single, a successful entrepreneur or working for somebody all of our lives. Make, it com make a commitment today, my friends, to pray but never pout about the, out the outcome. If he answers yes, amen. But if he answers no, amen too. For he knows best. I'll pray then, I'll praise for the opportunity to relate to the, to the God of the universe. But I will never pout as if I know better about how to run my life than he is for my life. Never pout while you pray. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. We thank you for all things, for we know you. it is you who do all things well. You call the shots. You order our steps. Our times are in your hands. And that's exactly where we want them to be. That's exactly where we'll find our greatest peace, our greatest joy. Not in you doing what we want, like you're some Santa Claus, but that you're operating in our lives according to your own will. So God, we pray, but then we'll praise that the outcome will be in your will. If it is your will, God, we know that we'll stay right there. And that's where our peace, that's where our joy, and that's where our happiness resides. So be with us and 
Allow us to have peace and never be offended by your will for our lives. We thank you, Lord, for all things. Uh, give us your will. Give us your peace. Give us your power. Give us your provision. But give us your preeminence over our lives. Make your face to shine upon us. Be gracious to us. And give us peace. In the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, we do give you praise and we thank you. And God's people said together, let it be so. Have a wonderful day in the Lord, my brothers and sisters. We'll see you tomorrow morning.